Good evening, everyone. It's so great to see so many people here um, for our event this evening. I'm Lauren Villanueva, Assistant Vice President of Alumni Relations here at Drexel. It's great to see some familiar faces and names here on Zoom, as well as um, some other alums who I have yet to meet. Um, but thank you for being here. We're really excited um, to partner on this program this evening with the School of Education. Um, but for now, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Rudis Foster, who's going to kick off our panel. We have four great alums, as I've said, who are here to share their insight and expertise with you, and he's gonna get us started. Hello, everyone. Um, good evening. My name is Rudis Foster. And I'm an associate professor in learning technologies in the School of Ed and also the associate dean for academic affairs. Um, just want to say it's a pleasure to join everyone tonight and just to have just to be here tonight in the presence of our alumni is, is, is such a wonderful thing. It's something that I've never done before. And I've been at the School of Ed for 11 years. So it's wonderful tonight that we're doing this. Um, panel, you know, as Lauren indicated, we have four really awesome alumni tonight. Um, Christine Galib, right in 2020, who's a systems thinker, educator, founder, with over a dozen years of experience in leadership and business development, instructional and program design, change and organizational management, coaching and mentoring, creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial mindset, development and education. She currently serves as a senior director of programs at the ION, which is an innovation hub in Houston. Uh, welcome, Christine. Um, we also have Teru Clavel, graduated in 2014, is a thought leader and influential speaker with a focus on educating Generational Z for the future. Teru was an educational journalist in Asia and authored a best selling book, World Class. I recommend everyone to get that book and read it. It's pretty awesome. She's also a great um, speaker. You, 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 as a, You'll, you'll learn tonight. This book details education policies and cultural practices that lead to academically and emotionally thriving children. Tonight, we also have Warren Hilton, graduated in 2013. He had spent his career in higher education, enrollment management, and student development, helping students, especially those from marginalized population, reaching their goals and aspirations. Currently, he serves as the Vice President for Enrollment Management and Student Affairs at Goodstown University and is also a faculty member at Drexel University School of Education. We also have Maria Rackley, graduated in 2020, one of our most recent grads along with Christine. Um, she's a proud principal of Cedar Crest Middle School in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. She's completing her 12th year as principal at the school and has spent 20 years in the building as learning support teacher assistant principal and building principal. So tonight, I just want to give everyone, let's give them a warm welcome to our panelists. Four of them we're going, to, we're going to learn a lot from tonight as it relates to the future of education and global workforce, moving beyond disruption. We all know that, you know, the education, the landscape is changing and we have four really awesome people tonight we're going to learn from. So we have so several questions for our, which our speakers will we'll, we'll, we'll look at. And these questions, as everyone, everyone is, is able to see, um, address things that we all want to learn. So the first question that I have for the panels to, panelists tonight is, describe your journey to where you are and what excites you the most about the work you are currently doing. And any one of you could take this question. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Foster. I'm, I'll be happy to jump in and start us off. Uh, first, let me say thank you and to all of you who are here this evening. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to serve on this panel. Uh, Drexel University has given me so much um, and I'm, I'm thankful to be able to just give back a little piece this evening. To answer the question, um, you know, my journey um, actually started in the corporate world um, many, many years ago doing computer work, uh, programming and networking. And uh, like many people uh, realized that it, it wasn't my passion. My passion was really about helping people because I had so many people who helped me. And so I decided to go into a career in higher education uh, based upon uh, my desire to help young people uh, succeed. 
what I didn't know at the time is that uh, there were going to be so many more people who poured into me to get me to where I am. Some of those people are, in fact, uh, joining us tonight, like Dr. Betts, uh, Dr. Bach, uh, Dr. Pittman, um, and, and many others um, who have poured into my life to, to help me get to, to where I am. Uh, and I, I believe I see Sherry Manson on here. There's been a, many a day I, I spent talking to Sherry when I was at Drexel as well. Um, but because of my passion to help others, it has uh, really is what excites me and keeps me uh, going every day. Um, we have a lot of work to do in education, whether you're in K through 12, higher ed, adult uh, ed, uh, uh, training and development. Um, there is a lot of work to do. And what it has been exciting me uh, since this global pandemic hit us is what are the new ways that we can develop and roll out educational experiences uh, that give our constituents and our clients, the people who need the education, the ability to uh, engage in our educational opportunities in a flexible manner, in a manner that meets them where they are. Uh, so that's what uh, I'm excited about over the last 12 months now. And uh, as we, uh, some people uh, call it returning back to uh, a new normal, uh, I'm even more excited about how, uh, how we are going to get back to a place uh, where our institutions can um, deliver the educational experience that our students need. So I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to some of our other panelists. I'm happy to jump in here. And I, um, the two thoughts that go through your mind before you start talking on a panel are one, I've cut my hair since I gave them that headshot. And two, how am I surrounded by such incredible people? And I think that's one of the things that really excites me the most about the opportunities that Drexel has given me and continues to give me. So I would be lying if I said I wasn't looking in the participant list and being like, oh my gosh, that's my favorite professor. Oh my gosh, that's my other favorite professor. Oh my gosh, my dissertation supervising chair is here. Oh my gosh, everyone I know is here. And I think the list just goes on and on and on. Mariah and I were classmates. Um, and I see so many of people that I've never met in real life, but who are part of my educational experience. And so I say that because this is what excites me the most about the work that I'm doing is that I get to meet people all over the world who are making a future that's not just different, but better. And they're doing it uh, with purpose and they're doing it with passion and they're doing it with a people first approach. And I think it's very important that as we think about not just what education looks like, but also what workforce development looks like, what, what the workplace looks like in the 21st century and beyond. And I, I kind of have to laugh a little bit because I defended my dissertation in February of 2020. I probably was one of the last people to do that before the world shut down. <laughs> and, my, and my committee knows this. I, I said that we're going to see a future where we will have a different balance of work life. Telecommuting, telecommuting will be the norm. Um, more technology will be integrated into the workforce. And I think that as educators, we have to take that um, challenge very seriously as to how we integrate technology, because I'll relate to this to kind of how I got to now. I work at a tech and talent innovation hub. Houston is the country's most diverse city. And we have two options here. We can embrace that diversity and we can truly create um, talent pathways and pipelines that are equitable, that include the people who have historically not been included in conversations around tech. And we can continue to create a not just different, but better world from an inclusivity, inclusivity and talent development perspective. So that's how I kind of got to where I am. Um, I've always been someone who, if you say, you know, think inside the box, I always say, what box? Because I don't see a box. Um, I see a world of, of potential and possibility. And I think it's in looking at the world as a system. Uh, and I've worked in investment management. I've worked in education. I've started my own companies. 
I see the world as a system. And just like in the matrix, when there's that lovely shot, when they see the code for what it is, that's how I see the world. And I think it's important because we're all operating in a world where all the rules have been broken. And that means that a, there are no rules so we can create and we can build, um, not just build back better, um, but build back really thinking through what that better means and who is involved in building back better. So that's what excites me. I think I answer the question. I think I talk too much. I'm going to put Mariah on the spot because she's my friend and she has a lot to say. Thanks, Christine. So Christine and I, we, we think uh, very similarly, I think a lot of the time. And so um, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces and friends. Um, as Dr. Foster told you, I've, um, I've had a, a really great experience in the K-12 world um, from being a principal to um, having opportunities through NASSP as one of their digital principals of the year to um, meet amazing people like Jay Billy and, and have great experiences um, where I'm able to just reach a lot of people and learn a lot of new things. And one of the things I'm most passionate about, and, and Dr. Hill's smiling because she I think she knows where I'm going already. I love learning. I've always, always, always loved learning. If I could find a way to just learn all the time, that's, that's like my dream job, right? And so um, one of the things that I'm just most passionate about is how we can help our learners continue to be those, those lifelong learners and really teach them the skills they need to be learners, not good students, because there's a difference between being a good student and being a learner. And so my passion is really helping our students um, become learners and love learning. And so we've done a lot of work in our school um, because, because and in spite of this disruption, where we've really started to focus on student agency and voice and innovation and creating new spaces for students to really embrace learning and, and finding their passion and finding what they're good at and really taking learning to a whole different level than what any of us probably remember as a traditional middle school experience. And so it's been um, just a tremendous experience and I'm, I'm grateful to be here with all of you this evening just to chat about um, your experiences and, and what we do at Cedar Crest Middle School. Hi, so I guess it's my turn. Um, I'm Teru Clavel and I will second what everybody else said. I am completely honored and bowled over all the time whenever I am asked to speak or partake in anything having to do with Drexel. Um, uh, Deanna and Rebecca both have brought me so far since I graduated in uh, 2014. Um, and I keep thinking if I was like the most annoying student, I'm not quite sure. But as that all said, I'm greatly appreciative uh, for the experience and sorry uh, to my professors if I was. Um, I think I, I've had a very atraditional, um, I guess, background in education. And when we were prepping for this, talk this evening, I, I was wondering, and I asked the question, should I be completely honest? And so I was told, yes. So I am going to be totally honest, which is I was a trailing spouse um, living overseas and as an expatriate. And I found myself um, with three children uh, enrolling my kids in local public schools, first in Hong Kong, then Shanghai. Um, and when I was in Shanghai, I thought, okay, I got to do something for myself. And I did enroll in, I applied for and enrolled in the Drexel Comparative International Edu Education Program. And I would be the first person to admit, I thought I was gonna read an article a week because it was online. <laughs> and then I found, oh my gosh, I was getting out a dictionary. I was reading, I was like, I didn't even know what basic words in education meant. I mean, it was, it was hilarious. Um, and being in a foreign country that had very limited Wi-Fi in China and a firewall and trying to even get the information was, was a whole other comedy in and of itself. But that's just to say, it opened up so many doors for me. And while I was actually studying with Drexel, uh, we moved to Tokyo. So I actually was doing comparative international education um, in person live, uh, comparing the public schools of Shanghai and then Tokyo with my background in, uh, in the United States. So I became a journalist uh, and my beat was international education, which was pretty awesome. Um, and then we came back to the United States in what year was it? I can't remember anymore. 2016. Um, and I really wanted to write a book. So I uh, came up with a book proposal, got a literary agent, um, and I got a book deal with Simon & Schuster. And anybody who wants to go into book publishing, I kind of don't recommend it. 
um, because I had lived in Palo Alto at the time. And I thought everything that didn't happen yesterday was already too late. And they gave me two books and two years until the book was going to be published. And I didn't quite understand what was going on. So anyway, I had a year and I'm going to say from 2020, what was it? 2017 to 18 was one of the most amazing years because I got a book advance, which allowed me to travel across the country. And I visited at least a hundred schools. I went to every education conference you can imagine. I went to local, regional, state, federal level uh, policy makers, and I did tons of research. And I walked away uh, with a network and, and knowledge that I thought was pretty incredible. Um, and my background in journalism really helped me because I, I'm not, um, I guess, afraid to knock on any door and just get turned away. Um, so then my book came out. Uh, what was it? Uh, late summer of 2019. It did quite well. Um, for me, I, I will say the best achievement was that I was on Fareed Zakaria's uh, GPS on CNN, um, which I didn't know. I will just say leaving the green room and you see these photos that are life size and everybody is a prime minister and world leader. And there you are. <laughs> what am I doing here? I'm the one who again doesn't belong here. But that was an amazing experience. Um, and so what it's what excites me is and I when COVID hit and I know these are future or upcoming questions, but. I have three kids at home um, and I am a single mom now with three kids. So I had a whole bunch of like life things going on and I needed a really flexible career. So I'm working on bigger media projects. And right now um, my book is being developed to become um, a, a TV series. And I have just finished my second book um, and it's actually a young adult fiction series based on um, Gen Z and globalization and diversity and identity issues. And um, that's getting shopped around now too. So I took a, a different path, but I needed one that could, gave me a lot of flexibility and creativity and one where I could share my voice and my particular uh, experiences. So thank you. Right. Well, thank you to the four of you. Um, we have 14 minutes in this section to go. So what I'm gonna do, I'm going to ask you one more question. I'm going to ask you guys like, brief responses, and then I'm going to open questions to the, to the to, you know, to all everyone that's here tonight, because I don't think we'll be able to go through all the, the, the questions that we have. So the question that I that I'm going to ask you, ask both of you, and, and it's, it's a question: What words of wisdom do you offer participants as we seek to move beyond the disruption or disruption in general? Christine, Priya, Tiru. Did, did you call on me because you want me to go first? Because no one else is going. Well, I got you though. Don't worry. Um, you, so you're, 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 you're the first person in my window. So I'm sorry. You know what? Everybody says that. And I'm starting to think everyone's lying to me. I think they just call <laughs> me because they know that I got their back. Um, but but here, here's the advice is, is actually two things. Ask the hard questions um, of yourself and of other people because we kind of get into a rut where we just, we think, all right, here, here's the path that I had imagined for myself. And that's the path I got to do for whatever reason. You know, my, my parents said this, he said that my advisor said that, whatever, ask yourself the tough questions and say, am I really living out my purpose? Do I know my purpose? Do I know where my North star is? And am I following the light that it gives me? Um, ask the tough questions and then this is this is the thing I said earlier. Don't limit yourself to the box. There's no box. There's no spoon. I got to say something about the matrix. There's no. And if you don't know what I'm talking about with the matrix, I don't know. Maybe I date myself a little bit. But there's no box. So so go on and and in a world where you can really reinvent yourself every single moment, don't be afraid to do that, because one day you might wake up. And then you, you'll be on the other side of that and you'll say, well, I wish I should have done this or I, I should have taken that chance or I should have written that book. I should have started this class. Um, so so that's that's my my two cents. So there's a great question for you. Are you sure you're not Trinity? No, I, I saw that in the chat box because over the past year, my skill set has become like it was in high school. I am so, oh, recording. Okay, now it's back on. You know, I don't know. I'm going to do an ending of inception here and I'm going to just leave that as a blank question without an answer because not all questions have to be answered in the moment. <laughs> Uh, 
Warren to root? I, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, so I'm one of these people, I, I'm sorry, I forget who said it. I love learning. I'm always learning when pandemic first hit and there were all these webinars. I was like sitting in front of my Zoom listening to everything, which got a little bit to be a little too much. But something that I heard um, or, or read, I can't remember, but it was a World Economic Forum. And they said in the next five years, all of our skills, 50% of our skills are going to be completely different. Um, and I really took that to heart and I'm kind of seeing the transformation take place already. And it's, you know, so to me, it's shift, it's, it's what, what, what was just, you know, articulated, which is you have to be as flexible as possible and see where the opportunities are. And for me personally, because of my personal situation, my kids and, and um, needing to have been available to them through this pandemic, I felt like I needed to make, know where I could make a difference. And I feel like I'm, and I, and I'm very open about this. I'm not a classroom teacher and I have so much respect for classroom teachers because the patients and, and it's, it's, I, 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 I love the policy part of it. I love the studying the, um, the pedagogy, but I, I'm not a classroom teacher. So know where you can make a difference. And for me, it's through bigger media products. It's writing the books for the kids, for parents, working with parents, going to speaking engagements, um, during the pandemic, you know, and I and I had to shift a lot because a lot of people were doing speaking unpaid. But one of my shiny achievements was I spoke to an audience of 280,000 Chase uh, employees worldwide, and that was a pretty amazing thing for me. So it's 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 really no way you can make a difference. And I'll just add to that: I was talking to a friend of mine who's a very very successful attorney, and she said to me, "You know what's so sad?" And she's she's about 50 years old. She said, "If I won the lottery." at any point in my life, I would not do what I'm doing right now. She goes, would you be doing what you're doing? And I would be. So I feel so grateful for that opportunity. So I guess those are my, those are my words of wisdom. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna piggyback right off what Taru just said because um, it, it, it fits with, with kind of my thinking. So if I had to offer anybody advice, I would say um, take advantage of the moment right? Like, and be willing to take risks and, and look at, we all know that sometimes we take risks and they don't work out, but understand that I think failure is an opportunity to learn and failure is an opportunity to get better and refine your craft or your learning or your skills or your passions or whatever it's all about. And so my advice would be, be willing to, to fail forward, be willing to take those risks, be willing to put yourself out there and have a voice because it's a hard thing to do. Um, and, and so taking advantage of those moments, taking advantages of opportunities as they, as they present themselves, I think if we've, if we've learned nothing in the last year, I think those are, those are some important takeaways um, about how we continue to move forward and how we move forward as educators and how we move forward as, as people providing opportunities for learners. So th that would be my advice. So I, I guess I could say ditto to all of my other panelists, uh, and that would be accurate. The, the, the one thing that I would add, um, as we look to move beyond uh, disruption, uh, one of the things you heard Dr. Foster say, I've spent most of my career uh, focused in on marginalized populations. And I would offer uh, this group, uh, as we think about moving beyond uh, disruption. If you can serve the most marginalized population, then you can serve any population. And, you know, that's one of the things that I learned uh, in, in the pandemic through experience. So when we hit the pandemic, who are the most affected? Who are the most individuals in education that were affected by it? It was the most marginalized populations low income, often minority populations, um, felt the biggest burden and biggest challenges. And uh, a lot of people came to me uh, at my institution and beyond and say, Warren, you know, how, how, did, how can you feel so comfortable serving in this chaos? And it really was, this is something that I've done for most of my career. I've served people who uh, did not have internet. Um, I've served people who didn't have uh, all the technology that they needed. I've served people who've, who've had financial challenges uh, and we saw that during the pandemic and we'll see it in future disruptions in education. Um, and you know, one of the, I guess, 
I don't want to call it indictments on, on education, but one of the challenges um, that I think we really need to look at is we weren't prepared to serve our entire constituent base because we weren't prepared to serve the least marginalized. So I would offer that is if you can find ways to serve the population that is, excuse me, most marginalized, I should say, uh, I apologize, uh, most marginalized population, then you would be able to serve all populations. So uh, think about that as, as we move forward, because um, there, uh, this time it was COVID, uh, it's gonna be something else in another few years. Um, maybe it'll be an economic disruption, maybe it'll be um, something else, uh, health-wise, medical-wise, whatever it is, um, we know that when disruption hits, the most marginalized populations um, have the biggest burden. So if we can serve them, then we can, we can serve anybody. So that's what I'd, I would offer as some words of wisdom. All right, so I've been given five more minutes. So, we, so, this, so this group can go to 805. Thank you, Kristen. So with that, I'm gonna ask the panelists one more question. It's a combined question, it's a double barrel question. So um, I hope you guys are taking notes. Um, in what ways has the pandemic, pandemic disrupted your field? That's the first part of the question. The second part is what are the most significant challenges and opportunities that you believe will characterize your field? Um, Christine, I mean, Teru mentioned that skills are in the next five years. So I would love to hear more about that in terms of um, what, what, what you heard and, and what, what, what are those, some, some of those skill sets. One of those skill sets that, 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 that I've just seen is being able to pivot. That was one of those key words over the last 12 months, become probably one of the most popular words, pivoting, being flexible. And no, you know, and no more in academia that we're more, um, more flexible these days. And an example is right here tonight. Thank you, Kristen, for, the, for five minutes of time. Um, and so the question to the panelists, and I'm not sure who wants to go first. You know what, I'm gonna ask someone to go first. So Christine has gone first, Warren has gone first. So it's between Kuru and Mariah, who wants to go first? Okay, Mariah. Hi. Yep, I'll do it. I'm in. I'm, in. I'm first. All right. So, um, well, as a, as a principal of a middle school, um, the, the pandemic disrupted how we do school. It disrupted how we do life. It disrupted every aspect of, of what we do, of what we've known, of what we've all experienced. Um, as parents, it disrupted, um, it disrupted our lives and our children's lives and how our children do school. Um, so uh, my husband and I are both school administrators. So I ran a middle school from uh, an upstairs office. My husband ran a middle school from a downstairs office and our two kids did second grade in our family room, kind of sort of together-ish with two different teachers. Um, it just disrupted everything that we do. It disrupted, um, it disrupted how we do school. It, it increased our awareness on the, um, in, of the equity gap that Warren's been talking about. It disrupted, um, everything, it changed our whole conversation about what students need. Um, because I think we stopped talking about standards and accountability and assessment. And we started talking about students' needs and their social emotional learning and, and the real needs facing um, a really challenging situation in a very um, inequitable world. And so I think, um, so I think COVID, disrupted everything in, in, in my world, in the K to 12 world. Um, and then what are the greatest changes, I think is the second part of the question. Um, but I think the greatest changes are bringing attention to the equity gap and talking about how we address that and how we um, focus on making things more equitable and how we have those really hard conversations, not only in our schools, but in our communities and with our students and families. Um, I think that it also caused us to change the way we think about learning. So in our school, it created really amazing opportunities for us with a brand new creativity lab, which is just what it sounds like. Um, so all of you who I had for creativity classes, we are putting all of your amazing learning to great use in our school. And we've created a creativity lab, which is a beautiful space for our students to explore their learning and, and really create and follow passions and really drive themselves and have a voice and use agency in all the ways that we've, we've always dreamed about as, as learners and educators. 
Um, and I think it's really just changed the way we think about ownership and the importance of that because our students were put in a situation where they needed to have that voice and they really needed to um, to tell us what they needed and show us what they needed. And, and we needed to respond to that and come to them where they were. And so it, it, it changed everything. So is it my turn? <laughs> um, so for me, again, I feel like the black sheep on the panel. Um, I, I could be wrong, of course, but to me, so I, I write books um, or I wrote one book and I was writing another book. And I, during the pandemic, I wrote three drafts of my book and tossed them all out. And then finally in November started my fourth version of it and finally finished what I finally love. And it, I, and I don't want to say the last year has been wonderful, but the silver lining for me has been that I really saw the book that I needed to write and it couldn't have happened if I didn't go through what I experienced. So I'm totally pivoting. I wrote a narrative nonfiction book about how our, our US school system compares to those in China and Japan. And now I wrote a YA fiction book about a diverse group of teens who live in the Lower East Side who are fighting uh, systemic corruption. And it's all based on the sustainable development goals, which I was exposed to during my master's program, which were at the time the millennial, uh, millennium development goals. Is that right? Someone's gonna correct me. Um, but I think for me, it was really just pivoting, pivoting, pivoting and figure out what message I had to, to to share with the world. And I felt like I'm going to be, I don't mean to be cynical, but I'm going to be really blunt here. When I came back to the U.S. in 2016 and I had three kids, I was appalled at the U.S. education system. We moved to Palo Alto. I write about this in my book. So um, if you, if you want to pick it up, you can read it's called world-class, but I was floored. We, we moved to California and I chose to live in Palo Alto. Um, and we could have lived probably anywhere in the Bay area, but it had what was considered one of the best school systems in California. And the superintendent quit on the spot. Five of this, all five of the secondary school heads uh, quit within the year. My fifth grader had five classroom teachers within the year. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And I, I couldn't believe what was happening. Um, and I would look around every time I came back to the US in, in the 10 years that we were away and I'd be like, oh my gosh, wake up everybody. Do you know what's going on in China? Do you know what's going on in Japan? My kids are years ahead in math and we have kids who aren't literate who are graduating from high school. Um, so during this pandemic, I felt like, wow, people actually woke up. Parents understood what was going on with education. I felt like until then, the school parent partnership, um, which I, the school family partnerships has even broken, were, which were completely, I felt like, transparent. And there was so much accountability where I educated my kids in Asia. It was broken here. And finally, I felt like, wow, COVID really woke families up. Um, so seeing that and looking at, you know, the air cleared up and we see what, what environmental, uh, what climate change really is and how we have to work together to solve these problems, COVID. We're not gonna come up with getting, getting rid of this pandemic unless there's global cooperation. So that's all to say all these themes are directly um, dealt with in my, in my book. Um, so, you know, that, that is a silver lining. Um, and I feel like looking forward, and this is something that I've been thinking about, and excuse me, um, Rebecca and Deanna, it's like something I've been fixated on, is when I look at my kids and my kids are now, how old are they? Almost 17, 15 and almost 12. And I look at their futures and I see the kind of educational experiences that this generation has had um, and how it's completely unequal. You have kids, I mean, everybody sees, right? Who's gotten into the top universities? 3% acceptance rates. I mean, it's absurd. It's, it, it, and then you look at some kids who, you know, have, didn't even have Wi-Fi to be able to go to school. Who've been, in, who've been in their their homes and their base. I mean, it's like, so what's going to happen five, 10, 15 years from now when these kids are ruling the world? And that's that's where I get hung up. Um, and so my books, hopefully moving forward, my series will go directly to the source or YA books. They talk to kids about these systemic problems. And I'm so hopeful for Gen Z. I think they're amazing. Um, I think they're really smart and um I don't know. I talked in circles just now, but that's me. <laughs> so thank you for letting me speak. I'll just say, yeah, I'll just say working in higher education, um, it's, it's kind of obvious the disruptions that we faced, uh, not just with online learning, 
uh, but I work at an institution that's largely a residential campus and you know how do we house people in a pandemic um, and and in some cases we didn't house people in a pandemic we sent them all home right um, so it's kind of obvious what the disruption is uh, my kind of two key, key takeaways is we in education have to ask the right questions and we have to be prepared to act upon the answers to those questions. So for example, in a residential campus, um, how do, not only how do we house people, but uh, there's a bigger question around, do we need to house this many people on our campus? Is there a different type of residential facility uh, from a revenue perspective that students can have in higher education that does not require, uh, like many of our institutions, to have millions and millions of dollars tied up in debt for these buildings, uh, residence halls and such. So that's number one, you know, asking, uh, you know, those right questions, if you will, and being prepared to act upon the answers um, and genuinely, um, act upon it in a way that serves our students. And then number two, in terms of, you know, the dis disruption and the challenges, um, you know, what I am seeing right now is how do we, if you will, reconcile, I'm calling it, um, you know, all the trauma that folks face during a pandemic. And now all of a sudden, uh, this fall, many institutions are saying, okay, we're back. And, uh, that's that, right? And not recognizing what people have gone through. How do we acknowledge that? How do we deal with the anxiety that they face during the disruption and provide an educational experience that they can succeed in? So those are kind of two of the things that uh, in higher education I'm thinking about that I know uh, as I talk to leaders across the country in higher education um, that aren't necessarily being talked about. Um, most people are just saying, well, you know, everybody's getting vaccinated. We'll be back in the fall. Well, what does that really mean for students who have experienced over a year in a pandemic uh, with anxiety, some students working uh, full-time jobs while trying to do online coursework, some students who've been away from uh, friends and, and family and all of those things. And all of a sudden in the fall, we're, we're saying, come back and everything is going to be fine. So I think we, we do have to have a trauma-informed approach um, to what we're doing in, in higher education and education in general. So thank you. Warren, I love that you said that. And I love going last because I'm going to borrow a little page out of your playbook. I'm just going to say ditto. Um, but I, I will add a few other things to um, I think this is an opportunity to redefine what leadership looks like. And to really think critically about, you know, when we look in the mirror, we got to be able to acknowledge the person we see back. And we, we got to be able to think, here are my strengths and here are my blind spots. And every leader everywhere has blind spots. We, we all have them. I think it's imperative that we, we ask those questions as we're planning for this new world to say who is not at the table with us, who needs to be here at the table. Um, otherwise, we're just going to solve the same, solve a different problem, the problem of the pandemic with the same thinking that we used that got us to the pandemic, that took us through these changes that we have to make. We're not going to do anything better. We're just going to do it different. So I, I think the major opportunity here is what does leadership really look like um, coming out of the, the pandemic and who needs to be here? It's, it's not all about the tech. And I say that I work at a tech and talent hub and my background is not in tech. The people first approach, who has to be at the table with me to design, think that solution? to say, well, you know what, maybe your solution worked for you because you've been in your line of work for 20 or 30 years, but I will tell you that solution is not gonna work for a community member who experiences the problem this way. I think we have to have those honest and authentic and vulnerable conversations with ourselves 
before we can even get back to to resetting and, and to what Warren was saying, bringing people back. Um, I, I also think that we part of that is rethinking what public private partnerships look like. Um, we're, we're in Houston. We're redesigning smart cities. We're thinking through innovation districts. We're thinking through what does a district that is accessible and built from the ground up with equity in mind, with inclusion, not just diversity, because diversity is what we see, but equity and inclusion actually get us to those solutions for a better world. So that's that's what I'll, I'll say. So I um, just want to thank the four of you for all that you've given us tonight, your time and your knowledge sharing and just sharing everything that you've done for us. I think tonight we've learned a couple of things that public private public private, private partnerships are needed. We need resonant leaders who can redefine leadership. And one, we need to engage in the process of design thinking more often when we're when we're faced with faced with, with with adaptive problems. Adaptive problems require adaptive solutions. So um with that move on to the to next um section, next next part of our program. And thank you so much again for your time. And someone asked earlier um, the, the programs that you're from. Could you just say what programs you graduated from, please? Someone, 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 someone text that to me privately. Warren. Yes, I, I graduated from the EDD. I was in uh, the first graduating cohort of the EDD in uh, educational leadership and management. I was also from the EDD program. Um, I think, Christine, we were cohort 13, I'm pretty sure. That's right, because that's my lucky number. And I will shout out the creativity and innovation program. That's the track that I did. And I loved every minute of it. So there you go. So I'm, I'm lowly uh, master's, <laughs> master's of science in comparative and international education. In the school of it, the one is lowly. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to thank our panelists and thank Dr. Foster for moderating our discussion tonight. I think we should bring everyone back six months or a year from now and, you know, follow up on this conversation and see what have we learned and what's stuck around and what hasn't. Um, but thank you all for being here tonight, um, sharing your insight and your expertise.